Cut content is no stranger to the Pokemon franchise, or this channel for that matter. Lately, I've been really getting into cut content of all kinds from the Pokemon games, because there is almost nothing on this earth that fascinates me more, and of course we are going to continue that trend today by looking at some features, gameplay mechanics, etc. that were either considered or planned to be in the main series Pokemon games, but were scrapped for one reason or another. As a matter of fact, there are 15 of them here that we will be highlighting today, so let's cut the jibber jabber and just get to it. In no particular order here, we are going to start with one out of Generation 1 that sounds pretty interesting to say the least, and that was the idea of the gym badges being usable items in the original Kanto titles that gave the player new abilities. In the code of the Gen 1 games, there are items present with the names of each of the gym badges, and while most of them don't have an actual use, the first two gym badges, the Boulder Badge and the Cascade Badge, will allow the player to throw bait and rocks at Pokémon during battle, out side of the Safari Zone where these features are exclusive to in the final games. This indicates that the gameplay could have been wildly different had it been implemented, but given that only the first two gym badges have actual abilities that can be used, it's possible that this mechanic was abandoned pretty early on into its implementation. Badges being items does sound like a really cool idea though, and who knows, maybe we'll see it make a comeback someday in a future title. Since we're here, we might as well go over another one from Generation 1, and that would be Trainers Battling Pokemon. Before Pokemon to Pokemon Combat was settled on as one of the hallmarks of the franchise, it was originally the case that trainers would battle Pokemon themselves, which is why you see several trainer classes in the Gen 1 games, including Sabrina even, holding whips as it is a remnant of this original gameplay idea. Gameplay-wise, it certainly was for the best, and it's likely that Pokemon could have seen even more content controversy than it already did back in the day had you ended up whipping Pokemon all throughout your adventure. Jumping into Gen 3 now, according to Junichi Masuda, changing the number of Pokemon a player can have in their party and the number of moves a Pokemon can learn was considered during the development of Ruby and Sapphire, but ultimately was not implemented as you might be able to tell. It's been stated whenever the topic of this kind of thing comes up that Game Freak has looked at these things and has considered changing them as they did in this example from the days of Ruby and Sapphire, but ultimately as they have said, the balance of what's currently currently there with these features is just too delicate in their minds to try and change at this point, and it's pretty easy to see why. While in this specific case it was not mentioned whether it was going to be an increase or a decrease for the number of moves and party Pokemon you could have, I can only imagine that it would have been increased considering it wouldn't really make any sense to limit it and give people less than what they had before. In my opinion, it does seem like the type of thing that will be played with eventually when the time is right, but if these two features had been implemented back in the days of Gen 3, the Pokemon games as we know them would definitely be a lot different today. Since we just skipped over Gen 2 with the story of those last two features, let's go ahead and cover something from the Johto games, the skateboard. Originally, there were plans to introduce a skateboard item as a method of fast travel that was said to not replace, but complement the bike similar to the roller skates in X and Y. The presence of this cut feature has been known for a while thanks to pre-release coverage of Gold and Silver, but we actually got our first hardcore look at it when the Gold and Silver beta demo was leaked a couple years ago, which contained within it sprites of the player character using the skateboard, giving us an even closer look at what it could have been. It was likely cut because it was thought that it might be redundant next to the bicycle, and while understandable if true, I personally would have enjoyed cruising around the Johto region on a skateboard, so it's a shame that it was cut. Since I just mentioned the roller skates from X and Y in that last segment, why don't we go to the Kalos region and take a look at a cut feature that would have been really nice to have, the Travel Trunk. 
The travel trunk is an item found within the data of X and Y that would have allowed the player to change their outfit anytime, anywhere, with a description that even says as such. It did not make the final game for unknown reasons, and this is one that I personally think was a bad move to scrap, because it would have made the whole character customization process that debuted in X and Y infinitely more convenient. Not that it was inconvenient in the final game, but changing your outfit on the fly would have been so nice, and I just cannot imagine a reason why it was excluded. The only guess I can make is that maybe they thought it took away from the whole French boutique sort of vibe they were trying to inject with this, but even that is a weak excuse at best and isn't really worth the amount of streamlining that the game could have received if it had included this feature. Backtracking one generation, believe it or not, a feature that eventually became Pokemon Ami was considered for Pokemon Black and White, but was cut. This is according to Junichi Masuda in an interview with Game Informer, where he mentioned that he had came up with a similar sort of feature where you would interact with your Pokemon one-on-one, -on -one, but they weren't able to include it in the final game, and it eventually re-emerged as Pokemon Ami in X and Y. This is honestly pretty crazy, because Pokemon Ami was such a huge feature when it was introduced, and it's something that has become a standard in one form or another in every Pokemon game since. So having it in Gen 5 could have done a lot for those games, and would have been really interesting to see interacting with sprites as opposed to 3D models. It was probably for the best that they held back on it, because interacting with a 3D model that can be much more expressive than a sprite definitely would help the overall enjoyment of the feature in in my opinion, and a few more years of development on it wouldn't have hurt either. Honestly, it was more or less an idea that was ahead of its time, and even though it ended up releasing at a time when it could be its best, the idea of it being considered for black and white is really cool to think about. Alright, why don't we head back to Gen 1 for a second and talk about the Charisma stat. Dating all the way back to when the series was known as Capsule Monsters, the proposed gameplay had a very different tone to it. Coupled with the mechanic of trainers battling Pokemon themselves that I previously mentioned, it was originally suggested that a Charisma stat be used to catch Pokemon instead of obtaining them through combat. This stat would have been tied to the player, and would need to be progressively raised in order to allow the player to persuade Pokemon, or Kapumon as they were known at the time, to join them. This one was probably for the best that they cut it, because I cannot really imagine a very exciting sequence of gameplay that involves simply persuading Pokemon to join you. If they had gone through with this, they obviously would have had something in place, but it just doesn't seem like it would have been as fun or exciting as Pokemon Battles, so it was most likely a good thing that they made this change. Another feature from Johto that was cut but eventually made a return later was honey being used on trees to attract Pokemon. According to some text strings found in the data of the Gen 2 games, this mechanic was originally going to make its debut in Johto instead of Sinnoh two generations later in Diamond and Pearl. The text strings describe the use of sweet honey basically exactly as it is used in the Gen 4 titles, and although for some unknown reason it did not make it into Gold and Silver, the developers must have thought highly of the idea as it's very likely that the headbutt mechanic was put in its place since they operate very similarly. This makes it even more puzzling as to why this had to be cut if they could add a near identical replacement, but it's always possible that it could have been due to technical limitations or something like that since Game Freak was developing with the technology of the Game Boy at that time. It's honestly crazy how much content from Gen 4 actually originated from Gen 2. Gold and Silver were truly the size of about two generations originally, back when it was thought that they would be the last games in the series. If it had been, they certainly did a phenomenal job of trying to go out with a bang. And as if Gen 2 didn't have enough stuff cut from its games already, there was also going to be a Safari Zone in Gold and Silver, right where it had originally been in Kanto in Fuchsia City. There did end up being a Safari Zone in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, but in the original Johto games, the Safari Zone in Fuchsia City was closed. However, there remains a map in the data of the games for what was to be the Safari Zone that would have been open and operational if Game Freak's original plans had come to fruition. 
fruition. The map shows a largely scaled down safari zone, which given everything else in the game is understandable, and lack of cartridge space was probably the reason why it was cut in the first place. But to be in the data of the final games at all, using graphics and sprites that were used in the final product, it must have been a late cut to say the least. Looking back, it was a bit disappointing when you would arrive in Fuchsia City in Gold and Silver, only to discover that the Safari Zone where you normally expect to go to find rare Pokemon had been shut down. But even still, the games were phenomenal, so adding this in would have just been the icing on an already iced cake and is yet another example of Game Freak's ambition with these titles. We've only covered up to Gen 6 to this point, so why don't we cover something from Gen 7? Very well documented, but still interesting either way, is the fact that Pokemon following you was planned for Sun and Moon, as evidenced by walking and running animations for every single Pokemon being found in the data of the Gen 7 games. It was probably due to technical limitations that this was scrapped, since Sun and Moon pushed the 3DS to its limits already, but that honestly would have been a difference maker for the Alola games, to say the least, as for the most part, people seem to be pretty split on them, but with the presence of Pokemon following you in the game, that would have easily made them much more universally beloved. The feature has technically been around since Pokemon Yellow, and has popped up here and there since, so it'll be interesting to see if it ever makes another comeback like it frankly should, but even in games like these that it didn't appear in, it's nice to know that Game Freak is at least considering it, and trying to make it work. The last one from Generation 1 we're going to cover today is the concept of illusory monsters. Originally, the Pokemon games weren't even plural games, as the dual release idea hadn't yet been incorporated. Neither had version exclusive Pokemon, but the desire to incentivize trading was still there, and the way that this was going to be encouraged was through the idea of something described by creator Satoshi Chijiri himself as illusory monsters. These Pokemon are more or less the equivalent to legendaries and mythicals, except it seems the difficulty in finding and catching them would have been ramped up even past what you can expect for a legendary. A green dragon was mentioned by Tajiri in the planning documents of the then Capsule Monsters game, and it was described as being found only in a very remote corner of the overworld in a dungeon and would take around two hours to find and catch. The idea was that different people would find different illusory monsters monsters, and playground deals could be struck which would encourage trading. The idea was also to encourage discussion and intrigue, as insanely rare Pokemon would get people talking with others about what ones they've seen or heard about. While most of this happened to a T and was very insightful of Tajiri to want to encourage the kind of playground rumors the kids of the 90s remember so fondly, the illusory monsters, at least in the form described here, didn't really turn out as planned. They more or less became legendary Pokemon, but with less of an emphasis on trade being put on them, seeing as how you can only get one of each, and illusory monsters, though extremely rare, could be found multiple times, allowing you some to spare. I really love the idea of insanely hard to find Pokemon that you have to spend hours scouring the game world to even find, let alone catch, but considering their likely evolution into legendary and mythical Pokemon the way we know them today, I would say that it also turned out pretty well in the end regardless. Heading back to Hoenn though, aside from the major potential changes we discussed earlier, another feature that was left behind were wild double battles. Double battles were first introduced as a concept in Gen 3, but were only available in trainer battles. Double battles with wild Pokemon would occur in later generations, but originally it was planned to be there in the beginning, and can still be accessed through the game's code. It's hard to speculate as to why this would be cut, especially if it had been put into the games themselves, but maybe it was due to just not wanting to change too much too soon and overwhelm the player. Maybe they wanted to begin with just trainer battles to ease people into it, see how they responded, and then go from there as opposed to throwing it all on us all at once. Not the most ridiculous thing to ever be cut from a Pokemon game, but still interesting either way. And from Hoenn to Alola, another big feature that was removed or simply went unused is being able to transfer Pokemon to Sun and Moon from Pokemon Go. 
Within the data of the games, there is information to suggest that this was going to be a thing, and that the player would be able to receive some kind of gift from Pokemon Go itself, if not Pokemon themselves. This feature was likely dropped for a number of reasons. One, as with the Pokemon following you, technical limitations could have played a factor, but even more likely is that they just ran out of time to make it work. Pokemon Go came out the same year as Sun and Moon in 2016, and if you remember, it took the game a while to get its feet under itself, as it immediately became a worldwide phenomenon, and there were a lot of bugs to work out initially. So it was probably the case that amongst all all these other things that were going on, they either just didn't have time to fully implement it or couldn't make it work reliably enough to release it to the public. Luckily though, integration with Pokemon Go did eventually make its debut in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee and continued in Sword and Shield through Pokemon Home. And last but not least, we have one from the latest games, Pokemon Sword and Shield. In an interview with Game Informer, planning director Kazumasa Iwao stated that dropping the turn-based battle system in favor of something else was considered at one point for these games before eventually deciding that turn-based battles fit the titles better. While it wasn't stated specifically what mechanic would have been in its place, it's likely that it would have been a real-time battle system, because if something isn't turn-based, real-time is more or less the main alternative. This also falls in line with a rumor that popped up shortly after the game's reveal that stated a real-time battle system would be used. So Sword and Shield could have easily been massively different as real-time battles would have changed everything. With everything else going on in these games though, it's probably for the best that they put this idea on the shelf for a little bit, but it's fascinating to consider that huge changes like these are considered for the games on what seems to be a fairly routine basis. Well, there you have it. Thank you all so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed, please leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already, and let me know all of your thoughts in the comments below. You can also check out my Pokemon remixes on Spotify to support the channel further, and you're gonna want to tune in this Saturday, April 4th, as there will be a Pokemon Cardinal Mini Direct going live that day at noon Eastern Time, and I'm really excited to show you all what I have to share for that. Anyway, I will be back on Thursday with another video, so be sure to hit that notification bell so you can know when that goes live, and until then, I love you all, stay safe, and I will smell you guys later.